I'm going to tell you a story, a uh, lot, le lot less technical ideas than a than previous speaker, but uh, let me go ahead and have a disclaimer. First of all, anything and everything I'm about to tell you is not endorsed by Walt Disney World or the Reedy Creek Improvement District. I do not speak for them. Um, however, uh, this is my opinion, the best of my recollection, of how a large organization starts out trying to, to create and build things and um, tries different things, learns from failure, moves on, and hopefully uh, gets better at what they do. So that's kind of laying out what I'm about to tell you. So everybody knows this part of Disney, the theme parks, Magic Kingdom, Epcot, Hollywood Studios, Animal Kingdom. Uh, just a real quick brief history, Disney was uh, Opened in 1971, it is a large private company that uh, provides creative entertainment. It employs over 74,000 cast members, what they're called, uh, and its goals are the creation of unique uh, cutting-edge entertainment, for promotion of guests who will return, and of course to you know make a profit. The Reedy Creek Improvement District was established five years before Walt Disney World by the state of Florida. It's a special drainage district acting almost like a county, and it provides a small uh, government that provides basic infrastructure support uh, services, fire protection, building inspection, uh, roadway and drainage, environmental protection, planning. It only employs 450 people. Most of those are firefighters. So it's a very small, uh, tight-knit group of people with a, with a purpose to support Disney's developments. Um, Walt Disney World is located in Central Florida. Uh, very, about 5,000 miles away from here. Um, Walt Disney World is located next to the, uh, just to the southwest of the city of Orlando in a smaller city called Kissimmee. Um, it's kind of blown up there. It's a large development as a project goes. It's over 25,000 acres, approximately 40 square miles. It's about the same size as the city of San Francisco. So it's a large development. Uh, I overlaid it here on the, uh, on the island here, so in the red there, that's about the size of Walt Disney World's property. It's pretty big. Um, the only reason I'm giving you the information on the watershed is water is very important. Water is important here, water is important at, at, at Walt Disney World and Reedy Creek as well. There are two main streams that drain the property. To the west is Reedy Creek, where the local government takes their name from, and to the east is Bonnet Creek. They have almost 70 miles of drainage canals. They're all man-made. Uh, they have special water control structures that were designed to operate without the need for electricity. Uh, the lower th third, the lower quarter part of the property is mostly wetlands and it is a, a, a wildlife management conservation area not to be developed. So water and drainage are very important. As a result of that, here are those special drainage structures called ammo gates. They uh, continuously regulate like kind of like a counterbalancing seesaw. Water pressure pushes on them. Uh, at a high amount, it opens up an inch or two, pushes on it more, it opens up a foot. When it's not pushing, it closes. So it's continuously regulating itself, and the elevation is controlled by the water management districts of the state. And these are just some of the pictures of the drainage canals that, that uh, weave their way through the property. RCID, or, or and Disney, is a phase one MS4. The EPA wanted Disney and Reedy Creek to participate, so they hired a university to calculate the average number of people in the hotels and counted that as population. They didn't do that anywhere else in the United States. So. As a result of that, we have to comply with all the rules, regulations, uh, inspect and maintain our stormwater systems, maintain all the BMPs during construction, uh, provide pollution reports to all the agencies, and uh, provide pollution prevention training, just as you're going through now, which is all good. So what I'm going to go through is, is describe how I've seen some of their BMPs evolve as they built the first theme park and so on and so on. And, and it is an evolution. Uh, this is the face that everybody sees of the theme parks, Epcot, Animal Kingdom, Magic Kingdom, Hollywood Studios. But what a lot of people don't know is how much effort it took to, to produce this. The Magic Kingdom opened in 1971. The park itself is a little over 140 acres in size. Uh, it was the largest construction uh, project in Central Florida at the time because in addition to that 140 acres, there was over 2,500 acres of earth-moving activities to provide all the roads, the parking, drainage, etc. And you may or may not have seen pictures, but it's, it's a lot of work going on out there. That's the Polynesian Resort Hotel in the bottom left corner. Uh, they actually created a 200-acre lake 
uh, out of the, the borrow pit for the fill of the Magic Kingdom. A lot of different unique uh, construction activities. Fiberglass Castle, they actually had their own small little airport at the time. Uh, the bottom right picture is the Contemporary Resort Hotel where the rooms were actually built on the ground, complete, lifted up by crane and inserted into the structure of the hotel like uh, drawers going into just. Uh, they actually then they built a monorail system, all of the types of things. So the major accomplishments after the first theme park was they built the first theme park. They built uh, probably about 50 miles of drainage infrastructure. Uh, they built a massive utility infrastructure for water, uh, sewer, electricity. There were two man leg lakes built uh, with guidance that originally came from western states that we had to modify later because Florida is not like California at all. Um, and there were two major resorts built. There were some basic Erosion controls used at that time. By basic, I mean floating booms and silt fence. That was probably it, because this was built back in the 60s. There weren't environmental regulations during that time. Um, they tried to bring in things that were used in western states, hay bales. Hay bales don't work in Florida. They decompose in our, in our rainy season, and they, they don't work well at all. Uh, they found the difference between sandy soils and the wetland muck soils. Sandy soils were far easier to keep the water clean than the muck. Um, and we're moving on, trying to get on time here. Um, about <clears throat> 10 years later, we built Epcot, the second park, much bigger, 300 acres. Epcot was Walt's dream of creating a dome city in which residents would live and technology could be showcased. When they finally got down to the reality of it and started calculating the cost of building a dome, it was cost prohibitive. He unfortunately passed away before they could finish that, but they modified it and tried to keep the spirit of it with technology and demonstrations of, of uh, future uh, innovations going on with that. And as a result, they built some pretty cool things. They built the largest uh, circular structure in the, uh, in the U.S. at that time, uh, the Spaceship Earth uh, uh, structure. Um, they brought in a lot of solar-powered uh, rides and attractions. Um, they expanded the monorail system and added uh, length to that. Uh, and they built another uh, uh, artificial lake. Uh, they also built uh, the largest saltwater aquarium uh, in the world at that time, in the Living Seas. And they continued their modular construction of uh, pavilions and everything. Uh, the picture there is just kind of tongue in cheek. Uh, but again, second theme park built, expanded everything, technology demonstrations, one lagoon. Uh, they had some international sponsorship of pavilions, which made it kind of interesting for communication of specifications between metric and, uh, and English standards. Um, they started doing wetland and upland protection of uh, resources. There was some endangered species that had to be taken into account. Uh, uh, one was called the red cockaded woodpecker, which actually lived in a, a stand of trees right where they were going to build one of the parking lots. So they had, to, they had to modify their design not to build over that, uh, that, that stand of trees. Uh, gopher tortoises, which are kind of like uh, land. Uh, they're not turtles. They're tortoises. They dig burrows. They live in the ground in sandy soil. And we had to relocate them and dig them up. Uh, I had to do about 200 of those with some, some people. Interesting uh, process, because other things live in the burrows besides gopher tortoises, which can make your day exciting. Um, we started using a chemical to clean up the water called uh, alum or aluminum sulfate. It's uh, been used quite some time uh, and uh, works well, but can have some issues you have to be uh, prepared for. Uh, there's the red cockaded woodpecker in the picture there on the top left, and gopher tortoise on the right. Um, alum can be applied by boats or can be applied by a drip, and it tends to make the water have its kind of blue tint. It's used currently right now in uh, wastewater and uh, drinking water facilities to clear up sediment out of it. And so, uh, again, what did we learn here? We learned again that hay bales don't work in Florida, so as that lesson drove home. We started learning that multiple rows of controls work better. A uh, double row of silt fence works better as protection next to a wetland than a single row. Uh, again, we learned certain soils are troublesome for trying to keep the water clean. We also realized the need to try to coordinate uh, a chemical treatment with an actual lab test instead of uh, just, let's just dump this in the water and see what happens. What happens is bad things, so we want, want to re repeat that. We learned better ways to uh, deploy our controls, such as uh, flo uh, floating turbidity curtains don't work in, in uh, moving canals, and we realized that we needed more education and training, so we targeted that for our next move. 
Uh, again, about 10 years later, the next theme park, Hollywood Studios, opened up. It was uh, a little bit bigger than the Magic Kingdom. Uh, but by then, with all the infrastructure and the roads, this started to become uh, entrenched and built in amongst a lot of other existing development. Um, if you look uh, at this picture here, you can kind of see how it's surrounded by some of the green wetlands and uh, canal systems. And it's a much more tightly compact uh, development that had to be looked at and, and managed in a different way. Uh, again, third theme park. This is the first one where we had permitted stormwater systems. Florida started requiring stormwater treatment back in the 1980s. Um, the first, first one that required that for permitting, I believe, in the US. Uh, this, uh, this was new to uh, some of the project development. We built some stormwater ponds that drained off parking lots and off of the development. Uh, we had to do wetland impact monitoring. The state required us to monitor uh, water levels in the wetlands to make sure we weren't drying them out. We had to monitor water quality coming into the canals around there to make sure we weren't uh, exceeding any limits for nutrients or bacteria or uh, uh, cloudiness of the water called turbidity. Uh, again, we uh, were still using the chemical treatment for uh, cleaning up the stormwater ponds using alum, but this time it was coordinated with the laboratory and it worked much better. Relocated a lot more gopher tortoises. Uh, and a major expansion of our controls. We started doing a lot better on it. And by that, uh, we got rid of things that didn't work. We didn't want to continue to do things that don't work. The definition of insanity is keep doing the same thing over and over and expect a different outcome. So at that point, we said, well, well hay bales don't work. So we banned those as a control. We again tried to encourage multiple rows of BMPs. Uh, we still found that the muck and clay soils were challenging. But now that we started coordinating lab testing for our chemical treatments, we were having predicted results. It wasn't just, yeah, I hope this works. It's now it actually started working. Um, we had to learn how to properly deploy our controls. Turbidity curtains had to be put along the flow, not across the flow. When you put them across the flow, they pop up like yellow parachutes. They don't work. Uh, we continue to realize we need more education and training. And we started seeing the need to do more actual testing on BMPs. We started talking with the local university uh, and got uh, DOT and the universities uh, working together to provide some uh, funding and, and testing of these controls for Florida. We required double rows of silt fence around wetlands and water bodies. Uh, we started using better uh, controls when, in areas where we were bringing in fill, such as sheet piling. We uh, discovered the use of inflatable dams that were very useful for putting temporarily across the canal system. We were doing some work. Um, in some instances where the problematic soil, the mucky soil, was uh, going through our controls, we removed as much as we could and brought in clean fill. And that helped a lot in some instances. Uh, we actually started having monitoring by the laboratory on a regular basis to tell us how we're doing with our discharges coming off. It was more of a partnership uh, development than uh, an adversarial. Um, and we started seeing the first use of uh, remote instrumentation for uh, testing um, on that. There's that inflatable dam, that blue, blue uh, device there in the top left corner. You, you uh, roll it out, stake it, pump the, pump the water into it, it, it uh, inflates and it can you, it can provide you uh, a dam operation in about seven, eight feet of water, and it rolls back up. Uh, double row silt fence there in the center works really well. Uh, turbidity testing, jar testing done by the laboratory. Uh, that center picture of that blue tubular device there is a, a data sign. We were the first uh, uh, major user of uh, remote data signs from, uh, Hyd from Hydrolab and YSI in, in the southeast. I know that because they brought one down and let us tried out, showed us how it worked, and then the, the distributor called me up and said, hey, you want to see the first one of these? And I said, I've got it sitting on my desk. And he's like, how can you have that? And I said, they brought it to us, so we're, we're using it. Um, again, about 10 years later, they built the largest theme park they'd ever built, uh, Animal Kingdom, 500 acres. This was formerly a, uh, a uh, uh, agricultural cow pasture that was going to be transformed into Africa. Uh, pretty interesting uh, concept for development. Uh, massive amount of uh, uh, landscape alteration, uh, again, down close to wetlands, a lot of things uh, going on, a lot of infrastructure support, a lot of different contractors coming and going over time. Uh, their, center, their center focus is the tree of life, a concrete and steel uh, 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 you know, recreation of an African tree with a ride in the center. And there were live animals being introduced into different sections of the park. This made it interesting at times for uh, inspections for erosion control and inspections by the building safety department. We had to get escorts and coordination to make sure you didn't walk up and check a silt fence out in a tiger pen. 
or next to a Komodo dragon or a Nile crocodile or something like that. You just say, what happened to Bob? Well, he went to go do an inspection and we haven't seen him. Um, so that, that made it interesting to, to schedule all that. Um, again, the fourth theme park, the largest one built. Uh, this is the first theme park with permit design stormwater ponds as opposed to the last time they had us kind of add them on the parking lot. This one had, had uh, 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 ponds for all the development out there. Um, some of the earthwork berms were 30 feet high, so they would hide some of the visual uh, in, enticements for that. But as a result, they, they, uh, the stormwater systems were extended up to the top of some of those berms. They were almost like missile silos. And you'd go open a manhole cover and look down, and you couldn't see anything down there with a flashlight. And you'd have to drop a camera in there and make sure there wasn't any sediment in it during your final inspections. It was, it was different for a lot of us. Um, when they brought in the landscape for Animal Kingdom, they could not find enough vegetation in the, uh, in the uh, landscape companies throughout Florida. We had just been hit with Hurricane Andrew, I think, in 92. And um, they had to go all through the southeast. They'd have teams of people driving along saying, oh, I like that big whatever that tree is in somebody's yard. And they'd go up and offer them $5,000. And if you said, OK, they'd bring the machine out, scoop it up take it off, and they were buying plants and from everywhere across the southeast to, to finish the theme park out. Um, we went through a hurricane. I think it was only category one hurricane. It blew some of our silt fence off of the uh, stakes, but because we had it properly trenched in and because we had multiple rows of barriers, uh, after it was over, uh, we just went back and reattached it. And so uh, that was pretty good testament to the installation crew for that, for that device. Uh, we used different, started shifting away from alum and using a different type of chemical, a polymer. Um, we learned that combining uh, perimeter vegetation with your controls works well. If it had some uh, native vegetation, if we left about a 10-foot strip of it around the perimeter, that beefed up the controls much better than raw soil. Um, and we tried to incorporate that. Again, multiple controls worked. Um, we actually provided turbidity meters to the contractors. We bought a set, we cal calibrated them in the lab, showed the contractors how to use them, and, and sent them out to anybody that was having to deal with water so they could kind of check themselves instead of waiting for us to show up or, ha, we got you. They would know how they're doing. And we found that if we trained and provided them with the tools on how they're regulated, they seemed to uh, perform better. Uh, we also did some internal uh, training of the contractors, just as you're going through here. Not surprisingly, People who were trained in doing certain techniques did better than people who, who did not. Um, we tried to develop partnerships that worked well, not an adversarial, oh, I've got you, but hey, what can we do to solve this problem? How can we finish this part of the road? What can we do to make the bridge crossing here as quick and clean as possible? We started using a lot of different uh, techniques. We started doing phased construction. Now, phased construction, all my training showed that you clear a little bit, develop a little bit, but what we found out phase construction turned into is how fast can you button it up? How fast can you go from uh, sediment controls, which is our silt fences and floating booms, into erosion control, which is our final stabilization, and that turned out to be uh, quicker than we thought when you looked at it. Um, we started use, like, utilizing temporary grassing in uh, utility crossings. Um, we used devices called port dams different tools. We made extensive use of geotextiles and wraps, cellar confinement systems. We started dealing with concrete washout uh, areas, things like that. Uh, again, we found another uh, material instead of alum to use, an anionic polymer. Um, we started using helicopter flights to, to monitor this project because, uh, it, was, it was like I said, it was 500 acres. You couldn't see everything from the ground. You'd drive across a road one morning to check on something, and at lunchtime you couldn't go that way. The road had disappeared. You'd have to go a different way. Uh, we had some different types of bridge building techniques called top-down bridge building. Uh, we required contractors to get erosion control training. If you didn't have it, uh, we had classes nearby you could take it. Uh, and again, we still had some animal uh, challenges. And so there's, again, here's some of the pictures. There's double row silt fence. There's a device called a porta dam. Uh, there's geotextiles. Uh, we actually used the, the uh, silt fence installation called uh, earth slicing, which is very, very strong. They kind of trench it in with a, a blade. Um, we started utilizing uh, hydro mulch, hydro seeding, which is not common in Florida, but it's an, an excellent uh, temporary or permanent uh, uh, erosion control. It's permanent, you're done. We started use, utilizing these 
10 pound blocks of polymer that would dissolve in water and uh, clarify it by causing the sediments to clump together and drop out more like sand. This is the bridge building technique I tell you about. Usually when you build a bridge, you, you take the footprint, you cut through, you're down there pushing equipment around in the, in the mud and making a problem. And this, this bridge building, they, uh, they, they cut down the, the trees about uh, stump level. They brought a special crane out that drove pilings in, and then they walked out on the bridge deck and built it across instead of having to get down in the water. They didn't shut down because of rain. They didn't get in the water. They finished ahead of schedule. They won an environmental award. And after that, that's how we built bridges from then on. Uh, real quick, additionally, since those parks were built, there was more development. Uh, Give Kids the World Village. There was uh, lots of other small resorts and developments, water parks, uh, all these things. Uh, they all, each of them took a long time to build, but we evolved for that. We started utilizing uh, cellular con blocks. There's, there's a, a flexible one that you can put down. It actually rolls out. A, a one-person crew can roll it out, and its uh, thickness is just enough that it it will grow grass up through it, which is part of our green infrastructure support, and you can run a lawnmower over it without tearing it up. Uh, most of these can also support fire trucks and fire equipment. Uh, again, just other BMPs, concrete washouts. We started using rolled, uh, rolled sod down. Rolled sod survives flows a lot better than individual squares. It's easier to put out. Um, and uh, we had, when we started, inlet protection started getting a lot of different changes. We always tried to use inlet protection devices that had overflow capabilities, not plug, plug the inlet up. Um, and again, I'm going to go through this part real quick. Marlene, we're out of time. This is where the, our laboratory, where I worked at, uh, did a lot of monitoring on property. So we had a lot of data. We had a lot of information on how the water was doing. Uh, these 35 scientists test all the waters on property, thousands of samples from the aquatic insects to chemistry to heavy metals. Uh, offer permits, they generate a lot of information. We use um, sonar to get maps of all of our lakes. We know the volume of the lake. We can calculate things. We get a lot of data. As a result, we can protect the wetlands better. We can make changes. Uh, this is the lower part of the property. Everything in green there is uh, protected wetlands on property. Um, we have full-time people now that do nothing but do construction compliance. They inspect, they follow permits, they provide training. Uh, we provide solutions for a lot of other challenges. Uh, looking at future uh, developments, they're also moving into green and solar. Retrofitting for stormwater, just like everybody's doing here. The older parks, the first one built, Magic Kingdom has the most retrofitting going on because it was built without rules and regulations. So putting in inlet baskets and things like that. The state has a program that uh, provides training and certification. I'm a trainer for that. I also eventually became the trainer of the trainers for that program and uh, worked closely. So Marlena and I worked together on that, uh, and, and it's still rolling along. Uh, we continue to promote and uh, have people go to training classes, promote ho host conferences, try to find controls and development that allows you to build the cool things, but still protect the resources. That's what's important. So in summary, I would encourage people to learn how do these BMPs work, how things, how things don't memorize a spec, understand something, something is a deflector, something is a filter, something collects and holds the water. How does that work? Um, learn from failure. I am a failure. I am a huge failure. Ninety percent of everything I ever tested and everybody wanted us to use their controls failed. If it failed, we made sure we used it right, we didn't use it. If it's successful, we put it over here in this small but growing pile of things that work. Quit using controls that don't work. If it's not working, why are you using it? Why are you using it? You're just wasting money, wasting time. Quit using them that don't work. If you have controls that are working, use them more. Use more of them. See if multiple, multiple layers work. Uh, test new BMPs. Partner with a university. Try to find some funding. Get somebody to do some testing specific to your needs. Um, create partnerships. You're doing that already. Require training and education. That's going on. You're doing this also, attending conferences. Celebrate when something works. I see write-ups in your, uh, in your, in your uh, quarterly reports and everything that's, that talk about good projects. That's good. It's important to celebrate that. Keep moving forward. And that's me up in the top left corner there when I worked in the Magic Kingdom. <clears throat> making hot dogs, popcorn, ice cream, putting in high school, putting myself through college. Uh, the other pictures are when I was in the laboratory. Uh, hair started getting a little grayer, and towards the end, I'm giving tours to state and, and EPA people. Um, again, I feel really blessed. I had a, a good time. It was, it was a lot of years. It's a lot of changes going on, but I met my wife, uh, 
had a great career, and hopefully I can still move on. If you need information, you can contact me later. But uh, if Disney can start from somewhere and move forward and keep building on success, you can too. But you have to just want to see an improvement. Most of the solutions are going to come from you, not from agencies. You guys are out there every day seeing what's working. You're going to figure out how to make this go. Thank you.